Hello. Looks like you're in. I am in. Sorry. It was, uh, it's, I still have six minutes, so we're good. <laughs> you're good. Good morning. Hi, good, good morning. Does anyone happen to have the link for people to register? I have a, somebody contacting me and I'm looking for it. Yeah, I think I have it. Give me a second. Let me just pull it up. Um, That should be it right there. Thank you. Huh? So, you would you like me to? Oh no, never mind. I'll copy that invitation link in case we need it. Okay, perfect.
Good morning, Sochi and everyone. Mean. Hi, Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you all? Good morning. Good. Thank you. Good. Um, Sochi, would you like us to sign in, in the chat? Uh, actually, we're going to drop in a sign in sheet and just. Oh, perfect. Do you oh, want me to you. do that? I can do that now, Sochi. We can yeah, you can go ahead and do that now, and we'll be dropping it in every so often. Okay, let me grab that. All right, it is 10 a.m., so let me just get my screens situated here. All right, it's 10.01. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining. I really appreciate you all being here. Um, my name is Sochil Tirado. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am a faculty lead with CVC, and I will be facilitating the norming session. Uh, we also have Marielena Fernandez here. Uh, she will be our co-facilitator, so she'll be like um, manning the chat um, and dropping in some links and answering uh, questions through the chat and things like that. Um, she's um, So before we start, uh, make sure to add your name to the um, attendance sheet that Marielena uh, dropped in the chat earlier and will be dropping throughout the session. So if you miss that link, it will be dropped more than once. And let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, there we go. Okay. So once again, welcome everyone. I'm so glad that you could make it. Um, I'm sure more people will be joining as we continue. All right, so this is our agenda for today. Um, our norming topic is gonna be section C of the rubric. Uh, we have some, uh, we have Grossmont College here. Um, that's going to present for us. They're going to be our Spotlight College. And then Solano College is also here. They're going to be uh, sharing their course template, and we'll have a little bit of a conversation about course templates. Oh, and then our next norming session uh, is May 29th. Mark your calendars. I'll have that at the end of the presentation as well, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, so uh, once again, um, Marilena is dropping in that attendance sheet uh, in the in the chat. So go ahead and uh, just add your name uh, next to your college. Um, all right. So the norming session is being recorded, as you were told when you stepped into the Zoom room. Uh, you can find all of our recordings um, of our past norming sessions on our homepage of our poker site. This recording will be available for you by the end of the week. So um, if you know somebody that couldn't attend, that's where they can find the recordings. All right, so we're gonna get started right away with our norming topic. So section C of the rubric, uh, focuses on designing online assessments to help us guide students learning. So the data that we get from these assessments is what we should be using to continue, continually improve our courses um, as, as we design and redesign our courses. So it's, it's a really important section uh, in the rubric. Um, so we're not gonna be looking at all of section C because we don't have the time, um, but we are gonna be looking uh, C1 at C1, C2, C3, and C4 
And then I also want to say, I should have said this earlier, but uh, our agenda for today, the way that the norming session is divided is that the first hour will be norming, focus on section C, and then the second hour we'll be talking about the poker process and other uh, poker related things. So that's that's the breakup of our agenda for today. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with C1. And if you guys have any questions, just please drop them in the chat. As I said, Mar Marilena is handling it and um, we can answer your questions. Um, so C1, authenticity. This focuses on the design of assessments that allow students to apply learning in ways that mirror authentic work in the real world. Uh, when we measure for authenticity, uh, it can be difficult, and some disciplines make it easier to use certain methods of measuring student learning. However, we need to be careful that we're not being biased on the discipline when we're checking for uh, C1. Um, when reviewing C1, we are, as reviewers, we're looking at assignments, projects, midterms, finals. Uh, check to see if they provide ways for students to demonstrate learning outcomes. All right, so here are some, um, this table distinguishes authentic assessments from traditional assessments and highlights some of the benefits like reducing the ease of finding the right answer, reducing the tendency of cramming the night before an exam, providing an opportunity for non disposable assignments which students can take with them and use or share after the end of the course. When we look at C1 as a reviewer, again, we're looking at the discussions, assignments, projects, quizzes, midterms, finals. That's where we're gonna find uh, and see if there truly is authentic assessments in the course. Um, in C1, exemplary means that the assignment mimics authentic environments, allowing students to practice uh, applications for their learning in ways that prepare them for careers in the field of study. So that would, when we find uh, assessments like that throughout the course, that's what makes this uh, C1, uh, C1 exemplary. It's when there is a connection to um, the real world in the assignments. Um, any questions on C1 before I go on to C2? We're, we're gonna come back and talk about these a little bit more. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and go on. All right, so C2 is validity. Uh, validity is very much related to authenticity. These almost go hand in hand when we're reviewing. Valid assessments aligned with the course and unit objectives ensuring that students are tested on the knowledge and skills outlined in those objectives. In C2, we need to go back to where the objectives have been mentioned uh, for the unit, uh, most typically, and see if the objective aligns with the assessment. If we have trouble seeing the connection, then it is likely that our students will not see the connection between the two. So here we're looking that the uh, assessment is aligned with the objective. In C2, exemplary uh, courses explicitly connect the assessment to the learning objective. So when it's very, very clear that they're connected, that's when it's exemplary. Uh, but aligned just means that the objective does uh, in fact connect with the assessment. So here's an example. Um, of an objective and an assessment that align. So here, um, the assessment asks students to compare the two schools, uh, which is exactly what the objective states. So if we look at this, this is an example of an aligned uh, assessment and objective. So C2 validity would be uh, complete. It would be aligned in this example. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to C3. As I said, we are gonna have uh, opportunity to come back to these. Uh, I just wanna make sure that I cover all of them uh, and then we'll have a chance to talk about them. Okay, so C3 is variety. Uh, here we are looking for courses that have a balance of formative and summative assessments. 
Formative assessments provide feedback and include opportunities for growth and revision, while summative assessments provide a measure of students' performance over time. As a reviewer, um, we want to identify that the instructor is not relying solely on one modality for measuring learning. So for example, quizzes. If, it, if the whole course is built on quizzes, um, that's this is where we look at it for variety. Um, this is where we can uh, bring that to their attention. The course should include a variety of assessment tools so students with differing strengths have equal opportunities to be successful. Um, in C3, Exemplary courses will offer more variety for the assessment of learners. Exemplary courses move beyond relying on one modality of assessment for assessment, requiring learning with variety of assessment tools. So students with differing strengths and equal opportunity, equal opportunities to be successful. So we want to make sure that there is different kinds of assessments in the course. We're not just relying on quizzes or only on discussions, um, which in some cases does happen. All right, and finally, C4, frequency. So frequency allows for frequent opportunities for assessments to be present in the course. Having frequent assessments allows students the opportunity to assess their learning. If the assessment comes too late in the course, students have less opportunity to modify their learning. As a reviewer, look for both low stakes and high stakes assessments, such as discussions, quizzes, essays, et cetera. Ideally, there should be at least one assessment for each main topic or unit. The structure of the content may vary though. Um, the idea is that there is ongoing assessment throughout the course. In C4, exemplary courses include assessment that occur frequently and regularly. Okay, so that is C1 through C4, uh, which is you know what we're gonna focus on today. Are there any questions so far? So Sochi, earlier in the chat, um, okay. Cynthia, we were having a conversation about um, what happens if the SLOs are not uh, clearly authentic or they don't seem to, you. it's not easy to tell um, what, um, so therefore, it's not easy to tell if the assignments are aligned or they are aligned, but we're not quite sure about the SLOs. Cynthia, did you want to did you want to clarify that? Did I capture that? Maybe. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm Colleen. I could clarify. Um, oh, thank I, you. I posted the initial question about that. Um, right. Sometimes when I'm reviewing a course, I'll come across an assessment which obviously aligns with this the slow stated for the course but it's really sometimes it's difficult to tell how that slow itself is authentic or reflects a real world type of activity or experience so that makes then judging the assessment um real world or authenticity a little bit more complicated because now it's it's actually meeting the slow but it's not really meeting the spirit of the the um, design review I see. So um, when remember that when we're looking at this, so um, aligned means that the objective and the assessment are connected. Like, it, you know, we don't have to have every single activity, con you know, uh, connected to the real world. And like, how are they going to use it in the future? There's things that are just like, you just got to know this, um, right? Um, but then, you know, when we go into the exemplary uh, piece of this, that's when we're looking for that real world connection. And um, so objectives come in section A, but they're connected to section C because we're looking at the objective and the assessment. Um, so there's that connection there. So when, when and I've had this discussion with uh, a few of poker leads in different colleges, it's like, should we be looking at the SLOs or should we be looking at the objectives? Like, what are we looking for? And what is like, like what is right? What is the right way to do this? Um, and there isn't a right way. And this is, I believe, true for a lot of the um, pieces of the rubric. So the rubric is a guide for us and it's guiding us to like decide, like, is this aligned? You know, is it incomplete? Is it exemplary? But um, 
a lot of these things depend on the design of the course. So if um, the instructor is using SLOs, then you know that that's fine. They can do that. However, I, I think it's more likely that instructors will use objectives. So typically our core has the SLOs, but then it still contains those objectives. And in most cases, uh, our SLOs are built upon those course objectives. So, um, you know, in it, it is more likely that when I look at courses, I see, you know, the modules chunked into weeks, you know, what, however they're chunked. And within those weeks, we're looking more of objectives. Um, and then the assessments are being created based on those objectives that then tie into the SLO. Um, so I don't know if I clarified anything, but hopefully I at least, um, you know, uh, like it, you guys were able to see like, you know, the connection between all of this stuff, uh, Marilena. So there are some really excellent questions in the chat. I want to make sure we, we look at them. Um, one of them was a question about variety and um, Allison asked it and it was the uh, the question about the composition classes. And so when students have, um, and Allison, if you would like to ask it too, if I'm not, if I'm not uh, paraphrasing correctly, but basically the, the ultimate goal is the writing, but there are different forms of the writing. And since I'm an English teacher, I get this and anyone else is an English teacher probably gets this as well, but, uh, or anyone, but most of the course grade, I would assume would be determined by the student's ability to write, yes. And, and I agree with you on that, but but the writing is also dependent upon the rhetorical situation. So therefore some of those objectives should be within maybe the discrete modules or the SLOs might talk about different types of writing for different situations. So it would be, it would be appropriate at that point to maybe differentiate specific types of writing as opposed to just this general ability to write. Um, so that's how in my English courses, that's how I would that's how I approach the, the different types of writing inherent in um, the composition course there. But um, that so other um, instructors probably have different ideas or different ways of doing that. Um, and there's all kinds of writing, right? There's journal, there's et cetera. So um, Allison, hopefully that answered a question or if anyone has anything you wanna pipe in, please do. Um, and then um, T.L. Brink asked about assessments being low stakes. And, and can they be low stakes? If they're low stakes, can they be summative and formative? And that was an interesting question. Um, and the example was a quiz in which only 10 out of 15 quizzes will be counted in the semester grade. So um, how would you all think about that? I mean, anyone can just unmute and pipe in or, but I'm feeling like, you know, if it's if it's a local, if, you're, if your local norming conversation is, if your if your peer group is okay with the idea of that, or if there's a as a pedagog you know pedagogical reason or justification, then I don't see why it couldn't be both formative and summative. But someone else may feel differently. Does anyone want to pipe in there and look in the chat as well to see? If oh, Moses happens. has his hand raised. Moses, go ahead. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's yeah. very contextual, right? And uh, this is something that comes up for me when working with faculty in very specific disciplines. And I'm going to give you an example, um, which is a business faculty who's teaching a course on writing business plan. Um, and this isn't even poker where this came up with me for me recently. It was actually during certification process. And, you know, my certification process is mapped to the rubric. And they're going, I, I don't know about this formative thing and summative because my whole course is having them write the business plan. And it's scaffolded. And I'm like, OK, you are actually OK, right? Uh, but it is a case by case basis because looking at this faculty member's plan, they have a whole scaffolded structure for stage by stage, step by step, having the their students write their plan in the different parts of it and giving feedback. And each stage of writing the plan is essentially formative assessment, but it's really a competency based approach. Right. And the grade, the real grade determinative part is, in fact, the final business plan at the end of the course in this in this instance. But I think it happens to be a good point of reference. Um, for just thinking about how um, there are contexts that blow up the formative and summative uh, approach. And then there are, of course, many contexts where like, no, it's really, really beneficial to frame it uh, through a more conventional approach to making sure there are numerous low stakes form of opportunities uh, that are distinct from your higher stakes summative. So just uh, my two cents on that one. 
Thanks, Moses. I appreciate that. I, I, I do agree. I think, um, you know, when, when we talk about these different parts of the rubric, it's so important, like Madalena said, to have the conversation with your team and like, you know, as a team, you need to decide like what is, you know, aligned, what is not aligned. I, I think there's some instances where it, some things are clearly not aligned and others where it's like, it, it does need a conversation, you know, because, you know, the, the, the way that the course is laid out, you know, looking at the whole course, um, the, the, the discipline, you know, also, you know, may lend itself to form assessments in this way and not in another way. So all of those things, you know, it's important to, to look at all of those things. And it's hard to say, um, it's hard to say, this is exactly how it should be done. Uh, and this is how it should not be done. Um, and what the rubric I feel does is it gives us a guide of like, these are the things that should be included, but they're not going to look the same in every course. They are going to look, you know, a little bit different. And, you know, we have to, um, you know, as a, as a, as your team, you have to decide, you know what, yes, this is, this is okay for this course, you know, or this course needs a little bit more, you know, uh, formative assessment and needs more variety. They're only using quizzes, you know, and, you know, it, they're not capturing everything. Uh, they have 20 objectives and, you know, in one week and one discussion. So, you know, those are clearly things that, that are probably incomplete. So, um, I see the chat. There's a lot of going on. In the I know. Chat. I'm. But Elena, is there anything else that I should kind of talk about before I move on? So there was a question about formative and summative, and then really separating those two categories out into one. A formative is a certain type of assessment, and a summative is another type of assessment. And I was trying to consider, op, you know, ideas about thinking about that in my in my mind. I'm like, well, presenting that might be different. I don't know. So this is a really good conversation to have with your either the instructor or your local norming team to figure out what it yeah. is. Um, I mean, we all know definitively what formative and summative means, but, you know, and maybe that's, maybe the instructor is just looking at it differently and, and considering those assignments in a different way. I don't, I, since we don't know the whole context of that, but um, okay. Um, oh, thank you. Um, and then scaffolding, uh, scaffolding, um, Richard mentioned scaffolding to define formative and summative. And less valuable. So there was a whole um, uh, conversation about that in the in the chat. And low stakes. I'm trying to think of anything else. Um, okay, yeah. So I think it's mostly just the idea of what is formative, summative, low stakes, high stakes, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and move on. So the next thing we're going to look at, and this will this will prompt more conversation. Um, <laughs> you know for. Uh, for us, which is fine, because that's exactly what we want. So we're going to be looking at um, a sample course right now. And uh, Marilena, can you drop that uh, link in the chat? Um, so Marilena is going to drop this link. Um, and just go ahead, if you're able to po pop the link into a browser, it should open up for you with no problem. <laughs> After all of my testing and uh, checking, it should work. So this is this is like our, our little activity for C1 through C4 to again like talk about you know and have something more a little bit more concrete to look at. Um Thanks. John, thank you. It does work. Oh good, thank you. Ooh. All right. So what I did is I just you know put in some information for again us to talk about. So down here where it says week four, this is a week of this course, this fictitious course. Um, so this is a fire course. It's three units and it's built uh, in a 16 week semester. So just to give you some context on um, the module here of week four, this is an example of what most course modules look like in this course. Every module in the course includes a discussion and a quiz, no other assignments. There are 16 modules. Module eight includes an essay assignment that is weighed at 20% of the final course grade. So you can go ahead and go through each of these and you should be able to click on them. 
I built everything as a page because I just learned that when you create a Canvas course publicly, um, or at least the way I created it, you can't open assignments. You can't open discussions um, as just a public view. So I popped them into a uh, Canvas page. So I know it's not designed correctly, um, but I just wanted to give you the information. So I'm gonna give you guys about uh, five minutes or so to go ahead and look through the course on your own, uh, look at the content in the module, and then decide if when we're looking at C1, C2, C3, C4, um, is it incomplete, aligned, or exemplary? How would you mark C1 through C4 for this course? And I've included a, a few links, the course design resources and the rubric in case you need to look at it. So again, I'll just give you uh, maybe a little bit less than five minutes on your own to look at this. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to look at this, um, now 
uh, your, everybody's favorite part. I am going to put you in breakout groups. <laughs> <laughs> and I am going to have you guys. Um, so I try to include all the instructions in the course so that um, when you're in your breakout groups, you know what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, first, I want you to take a few minutes to share with your group your findings. Is it aligned? Is it incomplete? Is it exemplary? And then after you guys share, go ahead and in your group, talk about um what feedback would you give this instructor? And just key takeaways. Like, you don't, I don't need you to write like a whole like paragraph or anything like that. Like what key takeaways would you give them? Um, and consider that, consider if it's not aligned, then of course, how do they align it? Like what's missing? Uh, and if it is aligned, how do they move on to make it exemplary? Um, so you have the information here. I'm going to try to make the uh, breakout rooms um, about six people uh, that way, um, you know, everybody has somebody to talk to because I know at times breakout rooms can be a little bit uh, quiet, but I'm gonna give you guys about uh, 15 minutes or so to be in your breakout groups and talk about this. Um, and then I'll bring you all back. So I hope everybody has gotten the, um, the link to the course um, so that they can look at it. Um, Marilena, can you drop it in one more time before I open the breakout rooms? Yes. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and um, assign people to breakout rooms now.
Hello? Can't hear anything. I can hear you. Oh, you can? Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I just joined the meeting. I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Uh, folks are in breakout rooms at the moment. Oh, okay. So they're in the midst of doing an activity. Some people might have either came back just a little bit earlier or had stepped away when the breakout rooms were set up. Okay. It looks like somebody got kicked out too. All right, so I'll just wait here then. All right, yeah. Thank you. You're so, welcome. Sorry to come late. Oh, it happens. I mean, you know how it is in higher ed. There's no one good time to schedule a meeting that works for everybody. So we just do the best we can. Exactly. All right, I'll hang tight.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I don't know if the 60 seconds have passed or if the timer's still going. So I'll wait a few more seconds. Sorry, did you hear that? Oh, oops. Actually didn't get to hear that. I don't oh, know. Oh, I said I maybe, maybe aspirational for, oh, yeah. Okay. You know, for exceptional, but maybe okay. for areas where um, they're kind of close to exceptional. Yeah. They might view that as a, an encouragement as opposed to being overwhelmed with a, here's what you have to do to exceptional on every single thing. Uh, right. Just right. a thought. Okay. Got it. No, that's great. Thank you. All right, I think everyone's back. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for going to the breakout room and hopefully participating. And hopefully you had a good discussion with uh, your small group. Um, so I had a poll question, but now that I see it, it doesn't make sense because the, the question basically is like, what did you think? Was it aligned, uh, incomplete or exemplary? But I just realized like there's four different sections that we're looking at and I'm only asking the question globally. So I won't even put the poll out there. Um, but I do, I would love for us to, uh, kind of debrief and share out what you guys thought of this. Mm -hmm. um, what did your group think about, um, the course and focus on those four areas of C1 through four? Would anybody like to, oh, I see somebody raising their hand. Yes. Camille. Hey, Camille. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so we were in the awesome group of group 18. Not sure if you heard of it, but we're actually cutting a record pretty soon. Um, and one of the things that we were looking at specifically regarding week four was that module that we were examining. Um, we understand that there was a lot of the objectives that were not meet, met um, in not only how um, the the assignments were pro provided for the discussion, as well as for the quiz, um, it was still meat on the, there was still, it was just bony. It wasn't meat on the bone at all. It was just still like a skeleton. Um, and um, so our group, um, there was com conversations about referring back to Bloom's taxonomy and making sure that if we're really going to help our students achieve that higher stakes of learning and understanding how they can be and get a full grasp of understanding, they we got to do a little different. So Carrie mentioned, she brought us back to the Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, and then Kurt and Roxanne and I, we were all on the same page of that discussion question, that prompt really should have been like a quiz question. And then that quiz essay question could have been a discussion prompt where there could have been some dialogue. And so um, overall, we said it's definitely incomplete. Thank yeah. you so, so much. if you want to, if you want to get aligned, you just need to do a little bit better. So, yeah. and we would um, give them those tools and tips and tricks. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Thanks. I appreciate that. All right. I see uh, Ying. Uh, thank you, Suji. So I was actually fortunate uh, to be a, in a really active, engaging group uh, with Maria and Julie and Tova um, with the six of us. We, we talk about each Ruby element kind of individually. Um, and then we all decided that um, for C1 to C3, it's not aligned, it's incomplete. Uh, frequency, we decided that it's, um, it, it's good enough um, in terms of the feedback. Um, you know, we, we decided just to tell them I actually agree with room 18's assessment about it being kind of skeleton. And um, I'm going to quote Maria um, in saying that the, the course look a little bit anemic, um, that it doesn't just, it doesn't have a lot of variety. So each, you know, frequency is good. Each uh, module has a discussion, has a quiz, uh, but not all the learning objectives are being measured. Um, and then we prefer to have a little bit more variety. Um, yes, Maria, anything to add to that? No, that was an excellent summary. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ying. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Richard. 
Hello, I thought I'd rise, raise my hand for my group. We were group 10, I think. I remember seeing that before I went in. And I had with me Janelle, Harry, Beth, Kelly, and April. And we had some fun time talking about a little bit of everything. It seemed like we had a lot of time. But basically, just as everyone else is saying, is we thought that they needed to expand the content. I guess would be a simple way of saying everything that has been said already. Um, we thought that um, more quizzes focusing on low stakes to high stakes would be a good suggestion because they obviously knew how to util utilize different types of questions to become more authentic in the quizzes. They had some skills embedded in there with the instructions and everything, but yes, kind of scant scantily clad with the link to the validity of the assessments and the objectives which were very complicated and yet the assessments were not. We thought that there should be more authenticity, more frequency, more variety. And we thought it was minimally um, aligned with validity, of course, but we would definitely have many suggestions for this particular course. Great, thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, Donna? Hi, we were with um, group eight. And we agree with pretty much everything that's already been said. Um, we recommended we would um, we would share with this particular faculty member that adding perhaps a video scenario and then having the students apply that knowledge that they got through that module to the scenario would lead to a would really kind of cover everything. Right? It would lead to a more authentic assessment, so that would work for C one. Um, it would also help with C2 for that validity, right? Really performing something. And then um, we kind of leaned on, we would give this professor um, variety. We'd give them C3 as a line because there is a discussion thread and a quiz in each module. But that, yes, we agree that's pretty anemic <laughs> and not, it needs more, but, you know, we don't want them feeling too bad about this so and we thought that the same with frequency that there's something every week which is great but boy it needs more yes yeah thank you donna thanks and sarah sure i'll just add agree with everybody um and we also um eileen brought up really the that some of these things especially related to c2 and c3 might get sorted out earlier on in our reviews and so that we all had a same process for supporting faculty. So this kind of led to a different conversation of how we help faculty align and that we don't necessarily just uh, review a, you know, the whole rubric and then sit down and show them like, okay, here's all the places you're incomplete. We kind of chunk it for them <laughs> like we do, you know, we want to do with our chunking. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of um, dis areas about objectives in A. And so some of this might get sorted out by the time we get to C. And so we were hopeful that actually C2 and C3 would be aligned because we would have addressed it back in A. <laughs> and, and how we support the faculty. So that was our, our kind of best practice conversation that led from this activity. It was a really great activity, by the way. Thanks for facilitating it for us. Oh, thanks. Thanks. So yeah, that that's a, that's a really good point that um, you know, some of these things would have popped up earlier in the in the rubric, you know, and and then um, depending on what your process is, which, yeah, that this conversation can definitely lead into process of like, how do you give your, um, you know, course authors feedback and do we wait, do, do we just give them all of the feedback or are we are we giving them back in chunks? And there's no right answer to that. That depends on your process and you know how what you guys do through review. Um, but I think that's a really good point. If if your process allows for like, hey, I see these objectives, like let's let's fix these first before we go on, then very likely that you know that would have been remediated and this makes me think again of the importance we I don't think we can stress it enough of faculty preparation before you know the design before the review if we have robust faculty preparation and then we really focus on how to write objectives how to connect the objectives to the assessments things like that then th this helps remediate you know 
things like this happening uh, in courses. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Lee and then Anna. Lee, go ahead. Um, yes, so I just want to add to that comment is that it's regarding to the review process itself. Uh, some school would give to a poker review the entire right the entire co course to review and then uh, get together with the daughter instructor to synthesize their finding. But in some other mo model where each faculty was given to say, you review section C and I review section B, and that make it the job a little bit harder because so like, for example, in our group, hey, great, great group. Thank you, everybody there. Uh, we were struggling with that. And so, okay, some of our comments, they share very much with the previous speakers, you know, about our whole entire course. But if we look at just section C, C1 to C4, which is the topic of today's class, uh, I mean class, well, I think I'm in class. Uh, <laughs> but from C1 to C4, then we say, well, you know, uh, they do have a quiz, they do have this. So then they do have both type of assess assessment. So if we're just looking at those, those, uh, those, you know, the variety, right, C3, they would say, yeah, it kind of aligned. Right. Um, but uh, authenticity, we can say that that's not authentic because we didn't see the connection between the learning outcome and that. But I think so it's really uh, there's some uh, there, I mean, some best practice of how focus reviews are assigned and the process, because that really make a difference in the time and what we could say about the, um, the assignment. So that that's my little uh, contribution uh, and my observation. I see my my team member in the next, so I will stop so Anna can go. All right, Anna, go ahead. I think Lee um, said it very well, what we came up with, which was uh, very consistent with the other groups. I think uh, part of our discussion was also helping the instructor improve by using backward design where we could focus on what results we want, connect it to the lessons and the objectives, so that we can improve the whole process, right? And um, another area where we could focus on would be that um, authentic piece. What does authenticity look like in this particular class? Here, we would need a little bit more input from the instructor, but there could definitely be more formative type of assessment created uh, for students, like perhaps in a course like this, um, if someone was working out in the field and they received a report, here's what the report looks like. How would you determine what caused this combustion and, and align it somehow to the lessons and the objectives? So this is also in, in, in conversation with the instructor. We're not experts in this area, but that might work. Thank you. Yeah, no, thanks. And that that's a really good point. And the reason I, I about the conversation, because we're not experts in this field, the reason I want to do, I use this as our example and specifically uh, this subject area is because I figured that most of us in here don't teach fire science um, in our colleges. So, um, and we, many times we are reviewing courses that we are not, they're not in our subject areas. And, um, you know, but we still, you know, we still review the course. Um, so we, you know, we look at it in, in, in the lens of a reviewer, uh, but I teach English. And, you know, when I look at another English course, um, I have to like, make sure that I have my reviewer hat on, you know, because everybody teaches differently. But Anyway, I, I thought this was a good a good example of like, no, we're not experts in the field, but we can like as reviewers, we understand like these are objectives. This is the assessment. Are they aligned? And um, you mentioned backward design, and that's exactly like, you know, what the course needs. Like, let let's step back and see like what do you want the students to learn? Um and another thing that it, um, is important, again, with the prep faculty preparation is that in these areas of like career technical, um, you know, CTE, um, mm -hmm. those instructors are coming from the field. You know, they're not, um, I, I came from K-12 and then came into community college. You know, so I had a lot of training in pedagogy and some of you guys may have had that training. We have instructors that don't have that. You know, they're mm -hmm. coming from the field into the classroom and uh, we need to make sure that we provide that 
that training for them because part of reviewing the course is looking at that. You know, we're not telling anyone how to teach, but we are looking at these pieces and, you know, uh, and helping them understand like this is this is how they're connected and this is how we build upon, you know, in, in our courses. Um, so any any other last thoughts? But I think you guys are right on track. Um, you know, the course needs work. The course, uh, as you guys mentioned, uh, it, it it is it needs a little a little more meat uh, to it. It needs um, all of that. And of course, I only gave you a snapshot. Like, you know, would it have been different if we saw the entire course? You know, probably. And as mentioned, also like, you know, if if you're a reviewer, if your review process says like you focus on section C, I think having an example like this really is enlightening because like, I think a lot of you may have wanted to like, or were wondering like, what does the content look like? What kind of lectures are being provided? Are there videos? Is there um, a book attached to this? You know, and maybe that would have helped. It, I think it would have definitely helped with our feedback to the instructor, um, having that information. So just having a snapshot like this, um, you know, it, it's hard because we don't have the whole picture. Uh, but for the purposes of uh, of of these norming sessions, you know, it, it's really hard to give you a whole course and be like, look at the whole course in 10 minutes and come back to me with uh, some details. So that's why I just gave you a snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much, everyone. Marilena, is there anything in the chat that I should pause for? Or is it okay if we go on? I believe um, there was one question on anyone aware of qualitative research on the uh, value or uh, the value of being reviewed by folks outside of the discipline. Um, and so there was conversation about that, but I don't, I don't know of any research there yet, but yeah. no yeah. one else can. And then, okay. Uh, nope. Okay. No, I think it's, it's okay. Okay. Do the conversation if they will. All right. So yeah, and you guys can keep chatting away in the chat. Please feel free to do that. Um, so this concludes the part of the norming session of the norming part of the session. We still have more, um, but I do hope that you found this information helpful and just having the space to talk to people from other colleges about this. I feel like that is so powerful and hopefully that, that was uh, something that was also uh, helpful for you as we continue through this journey of review. Um, so Marielena is gonna, I'm gonna have Marielena drop in the chat, the link to the survey in case you have to leave, because I know that there's some reviewers that ha may have to leave, but we do have more. So if you don't have to leave, don't answer the survey yet because um, some of it won't make sense to you yet. But if you do have to leave, I completely understand, uh, you know, uh, but we're going to go ahead and, and go on. We have two uh, other presenters that are going to be sharing some practices in their college um, that have been successful for them. So we can, you know, always learn from from some great examples. So I'm going to go ahead and um, present our first presenters. Um, and I think I'm sure they're here. It's uh, Jeanette Kahlo and Felicia Cocker from Grossmont. Um, they're gonna be sharing their college's poker process and other experiences uh, with the group. Um, so Jeanette and Felicia, I saw you earlier because I made you- Yes, we're, we're here. Awesome. Um, and I Hello. would just like to say we've got, uh, we've got Dawn here. Uh, oh, Dawn. Yeah. Welcome, Don. I'm so sorry I didn't introduce you also, Don. Thank you, Don, for being here also. And um, you guys should be able to share your screen if you need to. So I'll go ahead and quiet down so you guys can start. <laughs> So I hope you're seeing the um, slides. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so we're from Grossmont College and we're here to talk about our buy-in program. Um, and I just wanna say before I start that we have leaned heavily into the poker um, pun um, over at Grossmont. We really like the game. Um, so your dealers today, you'll be hearing from me, I'm the poker lead um, and Don is our instructional designer. Um, so we're gonna talk about the hand that we were dealt and I'm gonna pass that over to Don. 
So we had submitted a budget proposal and in a wonderful scenario, they came back to us and said, hey, what if we gave you more money? And as much as we would have liked to say we can do double the courses, we didn't have a pool of courses ready. And so we really needed to think about how could we use this money effectively and show growth and um, make it look valuable for the college to meet their needs. They had a special program for retention and success. So we um, realized we needed to focus on the training aspect of it to increase the pool of courses that we had. And we had had some early success with our first three courses that we put through where the first two went through normal. They did their own thing. They looked at the rubric, but they had some significant refinements. And when they worked with me to kind of brainstorm how they could do that, I introduced them to our templates and it was a game changer for both of them. And they ended up applying the templates. Our third course, which was by Felicia, who volunteered us for presenting today, um, she put the templates on her course before going through the process. And it was such a huge difference. She had so little refinements that she needed to do. So we knew we had something there. And so we decided to incentivize using the templates. So that was the ask is to use the templates so that we could get a group of courses ready. And then one of the goals was it would reach the larger campus. If we work with 50 faculty each year, we anticipate that that will at least touch 100 courses because we have a mixture of adjunct and full-time faculty. And in addition, our full-time faculty always have a blend of face-to-face -face and online courses. So the changes that we are teaching them through the poker process would also affect their face-to-face -face courses. Okay, so what we came up with is what we're calling buy-in. Um, so what's buy-in in, in regular poker? Um, it's entering the tournament with an upfront payment in our poker. It's prepping online courses using these design plus templates that Dawn um, designed and they're amazing and Dawn is amazing. Um, and the difference here is that we feel like everyone wins um, because the student wins from a much better design course, the faculty member wins and um, the school wins. And then also the faculty gets paid instead of having to pay us. Um, so um, we think that this, we, we know that this will improve course structure right now, where I think we're uh, preaching to the choir here, um, but this is kind of what we use to, to sell buy-in at our school, um, to improve course structure, to um, lessen students' cognitive load. Um, we also feel that it increases equity, retention, and student persistence and success. Um, and then it will pre better prepare our courses for poker review. Um, so for our gameplay, um, participants get a development course container with preloaded templates, guided high flex workshops, instructional videos, and a Canvas course, one-on-one -on -one time with office hour and office hours with trainers and suggested target dates. We piloted this in the fall with 25 instructors representing 14 departments. Um, we had five live workshops and three dedicated trainers available. And I'll pass it back to Don. So we're going to give you a little snapshot of some of the things that we just talked about in the previous slide that we provided. And this is great um, lead in because I know somebody else is now going to be talking about templates later. So ours um, really focuses on the templates and we do use design plus, but we kind of changed it a little bit as I worked with faculty. I recognized that for me going into design plus applying a template, it's like click, click, click done but that's a few clicks. And so that was overwhelming for some of our faculty as I met with them. So I looked for ways to reduce some of that and came up with creating a template pack. So we created a module that has one of each template. And when we build their sandboxes, um, it automatically puts this template into the sandbox for them. So if you're not using Design Plus, this could be a way that you could have a designer create your um, templates and do this portion the same. You wouldn't need Design Plus for this. We have them really focus on these templates and make those big decisions about what colors do they want to use, um, putting their objectives and outcomes onto the templates so that if they spend the time here making those decisions, it saves them time later as they apply it throughout the course. And also we really focus in on customization so that they can express their subject matter or their color scheme. And I always tease them, I'm like, you don't have to use Grossmont Green, but I do. So um, we, we promote that a lot. The next slide. 
one of the things that we were um, heavily inspired and when, you know, I love that Jeanette gives me credit for templates, but I get credit from all of you all. I've been like looking at everybody's templates. We had a faculty member do the initial build for us and then we've just continued to change them. So it's obvious, definitely a team effort and shout out to Riverside Community College District for cluing me into how I could use these editor only instructions that are a part of Design Plus. So when you are in edit mode of the template, this appears, but when you close the page or save the page, it does not appear to the students. And this was super helpful with us because I, I imagine many of you have experienced this. When you're working with faculty, sometimes you're pushing against long held beliefs that they had, that things have changed. And they're like, but I don't agree with that. And why do we have to do that? So we tell them you can add stuff. So like if if we didn't encompass something that that goes with your subject matter, definitely add it. And one of the examples I use is I'm tired of the word overview. So I'm like, if you have a better word, change that word. And so somebody uses preview, which I thought was nice. But when you wanna take something away, we ask you to pause and think about it for a minute and think, is that gonna take away from my poker alignment? So we're like, add, but try not to delete. And if you delete, make sure you have that conversation with yourself, like, is this still gonna work? And so these um, embedding this into the templates also removes me from that conversation. And they can think about that without being like, Dawn said, you have to do this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So we give them um, five workshops. Sorry, I'm trying to make sure I'm on my right slides over here. Um, and we go over different things at each workshop. So we start with the syllabus and the homepage. And then based on our discussion today, I really felt confident about how we do out objectives and outcomes. We take a pause and a breather from the building. And we have Felicia who's here, who's our slow coordinator. It was one of the many reasons we picked her to be a trainer on our team because she takes that week and just talks about objectives and outcomes and gives has that conversation, gives tips, shares Bloom's taxonomy. We show them you know, how they're in their course outline of record, they're in their syllabi, and we've also preloaded them into Canvas. So we show them how to find them into Canvas and that they can attach them to their assessments. And so taking that week really um, to do that really helps the rest of the time go well and because Felicia is just such a wealth of knowledge on that. And then originally, I'll tell you, we thought that we'd do pages next, but we switched because when we do assignments, discussions, and quizzes, because they're pretty basic. Like you have instructions, you have you tie things in. It, you can follow a similar pattern for them, but um, pages is when you get into all the differences, like I have this I want to share and just different layouts. So by putting pages at the end, by the time they get there, they've gained confidence in using the tools and have kind of worked through a lot of the items. We also have a course for them. So um, they get the sandbox where they create the content, but we have a course that supports it. So even though we have those meetings every week, we know not everybody wants to spend their time attending a live session or they need that um, content to be shared again. So we created a course. We also added what's called a poker lounge. It's our little discussion area where we hope that they'll connect with each other. And we link to the design rubric and have just supporting content in there. Some of that supporting content is the instructional videos. So even though we do the Zoom session, I've pre-recorded very short, tight videos for every topic so they can come in here. So when they're working on their overview page, they can go look at the video that relates to it. So the videos are included in the page where we're talking about the items, but then we have a resource library area and that's what you're seeing here where we put them together. We also have um, fabulous poker team working and we have um, two dedicated trainers for buy-in. Um, so um, joining Don and I are Felicia and Beth, our two poker buy-in trainers. And we um, divide our participants up into two teams, team Felicia and team Beth. Um, and they work directly with their assigned trainer, um, which adds a little bit of fun. Um, the trainers also offer office hours, <laughs> um, scheduled office hours three times a week. Um, and that's open to everyone regardless of their assigned trainer. And this is so we can just catch everybody, um, including people who maybe don't have time to, um, or don't think ahead to schedule a meeting. They're like, okay, I'll just go to the office hours. Um, so that is something we added new um, following the pilot. Um, and we think that will be pretty successful. 
Um, and we have checkpoints and these are our um, suggested deadlines that we give the faculty. Um, they have about a week to put together one page of each kind. Um, and then they have a final um, deadline um, for us. It's in, now it's gonna be in the summer. So we give them a lot of time to work on applying it to their entire course. But we wanna make sure that they're, they're able to apply it to each kind of page um, before the end of the semester. Um, so I just wanna share some um, glow ups that we have. Um, this is after our pilot. Um, so the one thing that um, I think is really exciting about this is um, that they don't all look the same. That was something that uh, people were really worried about. They're like, oh, I don't want it to look corporate. I don't want it to look like um, everybody else's. And we found that all of these courses started from the same template and they don't look the same. Dawn, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I just love the different colors. And it, and now that we have the samples from the first set, now we are able to share it with the second. So the first one we kept having to say, you can do this. Now we have some great samples. But can you make your graphic show up? Because that's the, my favorite part of this. Slide. Oh, yeah, that's okay. okay. So I love this graphic because <laughs> beforehand we have that Rubik's cube that's all messed up. And then once they like apply the templates, then it's all neat and tidy. And I just thought that was cute and how it ties into it. Yeah, but then it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just want to share some participant feedback. Um, it was mostly positive. There's definitely, um, you know, this is a lot more. We're able to pay them for 10 hours of work, but this is a lot more than 10 hours. And we're, we made that pretty clear at the beginning of the fall pilot, but I think we might have made that overly clear at the beginning of this pilot. Um, it's going to take a lot more than 10 hours. We're glad that we can offer them some money, but it is, you know, a significant amount of work for the faculty. Um, but overall, they... Um, they provided positive feedback and I especially like this one. It's so rewarding to see my course turn from meh to pretty once you get the hang of it. Um, so we were excited about that. And then an unintended um, benefit, it's not, I mean, it's not unintended. We didn't want to help the students, but one of our participants, Adele Rowe, she's the distance ed coordinator um, and I believe she's here right now. Um, she like put in a check, like a, a random check with her students in her Canvas course to see like how they were doing. And unsolicited, they offered a lot of positive feedback about the design of the course. Um, and we were really excited about this because um, it honestly sounds like some of these are made up. They're so positive, <laughs> um, but they're not. They, we really saw this in Adele's course. Um, students are really liking how clear the course is and how they can navigate it so much more easily. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, some additional pay payouts at our campus is we have increased awareness of poker. Um, so this is helping us build um, the knowledge around campus. And then we've had instructor requests from outside our target audience, including web assisted classes, hybrid and high flex, and then those who have publisher content within their course. So we're working with them, although they may not be able to go through the poker review process, they can certainly go through poker buy-in and, and apply the templates. Um, and we have a lot of de departments developing courses to share with their new hires. So we think this is building a good foundation for classes in the future. For our path forward, um, we're working on increasing the number of courses applying poker design concepts, tracking the improvement each semester and investing in the process. Um, so if you wanna contact us for more questions, um, if you send this email address, that goes to both Don and I, and we, um, we're pretty good about answering email between the two of us. So we'll hopefully get back to you. <laughs> um, and that's it. I see a lot of comments in the chat and I want to say I feel for you. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a session where somebody had some cool tool that we can't afford. And so I get that. Um, it's actually a relatively inexpensive tool. So I'll just say that and you can work with that. But um, the the part where I showed and we just glossed over it, but I talked about how creating that module you could do that with a very simple blocked out content and you could just put in places for them to put their objectives. It can be very streamlined. We're grateful that we have the tools and it allows us to do things like columns and accordions and all this stuff. But the key part of poker is providing a place to help them make those connections. So even if you did a very simplified version with just simple graphics or simple buttons, you could apply this. You would just need somebody to do that initial build for you. Right, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat, just a lot of like uh, good positive feedback and a lot of um, us wishing that we had a course designer. I am a D coordinator at Imperial Valley College. 
Um, so I hear the calls for having a course designer on, on our team. Um, any questions for um, for Don and Jeanette? All right, I think we're good. Well, thank you so much both for this presentation. Um, I know that buy-in is difficult. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're always finding ways of attracting faculty to uh, get their courses aligned and reviewed and badged and all of that. So this was really helpful. Um, you know, just you guys have an amazing team, but I think uh, the process that you guys follow, you know, I, I think that's something that can be implemented in, you know, even if, if our team is a lot smaller at our college. So I really appreciate, um, and I'm sure everybody else does too, um, you sharing this uh, with us. All right. Um, oh, Eileen is asking for tips for getting poker funded in, or institutionalized. Um, so I'll tell you, that was super hard for us. You're seeing, I, I've been in my position for six years, and I think we've been working on it for five years, and it was not getting traction at all. We struggled, and we barely skated in getting poker certified at the end of June of 2023. So what you're seeing is that a lot of movement suddenly happened for us, and the key was that I have a dean that's very supportive. And we were very communicative about our poker process. And he was supportive of that. And he was happy about what we did. And he talked about it everywhere. And so then once this funding came up and the college is setting goals for retention and success, they heard from him what we were doing. And they're like, well, what if we gave you some money? So I, in a million years, didn't think this was going to happen. I was begging and borrowing and trying to just get another year funded when this happened. And then so thankfully, because we had thought about it, we were ready. We're like, okay, let's let's take this money and run and see what we can do with it. And that's when we had the trainers. It's always been just me and Adele, our DE coordinator, but we had some release time and some uh, money to pay trainers because of this funding. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that. We appreciate it. I know that's always uh, a question is funding, how to get funded, where to find funding, um, you know, so we are thankful for any, um, any examples, uh, any feedback we can get. That's great. I would just right. like to add that we were able oh. to get equity funding as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a big part of, of the argument is that this is making our courses more equitable. So, I so know. very true. Yeah, very true. All right. So uh, we're going to go ahead and continue um, our next presenter is John Bettis from Solano College. Uh, he's gonna be talking about course templates, which is actually, you know, it just worked out perfectly that, uh, you know, we can uh, continue to talk about that topic. So um, actually before I have John start, I have a poll question and I think this one is gonna work cause I, it's, it's yes or no. So let's see, uh, let me make sure it's the right one, yes. So there's the question. I try to give you the right choices, but I may, of course, it's it's too hard to capture everyone's uh, experience or the way everyone uh, functions. Give it a few more seconds before I end it. Okay, so let me go ahead and end that poll and share the results. So it looks like out of those that answered, um, a lot of people do, a lot of colleges do have it as a resource and a few adopt it and then there's some no's. All right, so I'll go ahead and stop and John, go right ahead. Thank you, I shared first before unmuting the big mistake. So hopefully you can see our blueprint. So thank you, uh, my name is John Perez. I'm the former DE coordinator at Solano College, and my new role is the director of online education. 
So we have been using blueprints for like 12, 13 years for a very long time. And they sort of progressed. Um, initially, we had a technologist who worked on creating them. And there was just basic information about the college. But then as we became more um, focused on poker and poker alignment, we wanted to sort of sneak in some of the poker rubric requirements without having um, faculty to stress out over it. So what you're seeing are the blueprint courses for fall. And this is just one shell that we drop into every single uh, course at the start of the, um, uh, the, the, the term, right? So we usually open up the shells like two months, three months beforehand. And so it gives faculty an opportunity to, you know, really create them and customize them. So this is one of our more complex shells that we put out in fall. It was a little bit too complex. We had some tough learnings from this, but we use the tabs and this was just basic tabs, which gives faculty an opportunity to put in some information about their courses, each of their courses. It has to be customized each semester, especially for faculty who like to copy over and over, which also creates more concern for the DE team. Um, course policies, things that we don't want um, eliminated. And as you are looking at this, you're probably noticing some of our work from today and some of the rubric items that are popping up here. And it's all um, formatted for accessibility as well, which makes it a lot easier when we start running some of these courses through uh, Poker Review. Uh, grading policies for the college are here. And all these pages are um, editable by faculty. And then the last tab has critical dates that we drop in for the semester. We put in a note for faculty to double check uh, their individual rosters because of variances on start dates and times. When you look at the modules here, we built out um, helpful resources, which would be for students, which goes to the Canvas um, overview page for the semester. Um, and again, this is when the broken videos, so ignore that. This is These are old. Um, and these are some of the uh, tools that we have available. So some faculty like certain components, and we love that because the more they adopt, the more compliant their shell is going to be. We have a student orientation module for all of our online learners, which covers the basics of intro and online learning, tech readiness, Canvas readiness. There's some quizzes built in here. The quizzes are editable by the faculty. Some faculty require them for all their students. Others just delete them and still keep the information in there. So we have those options. And then we recently put in holders for the anonymous survey feedback for at least the end of the class. We're encouraging more uh, throughout the semester. So we're getting that feedback that's anonymous uh, for the students. And then in fall, we also created sample modules. So I think the previous um, presentation talked about modules in Design Plus. We also use Design Plus and we have, we love it and we hate it because it's so complex that sometimes people get uh, overwhelmed. And also if you have faculty who get excited and we have a template and they start changing stuff and not using Design Plus, it breaks the code, which creates more problems. So we found that having these sample modules was great just not on the blueprints because what happens is every time a faculty member will copy their course over, they don't delete this stuff. So then they have like hundreds of garbage pages. And so we've been incorporating the blueprints into our flex sessions, best, best practices for starting a semester and for shells and how to eliminate some of this clutter. We also started naming each of these pages because if you copy the same content over, you'll see a dash one, two, three. We had somebody that had like an overview dash 12. So they just every semester keep copying and never remove stuff. So with those learnings, and we also have a DE committee that's really um, diverse and really is in touch with the, the faculty population. And we reach out to our students and ask what's what works, what doesn't work. And so from here, we created new blueprints for spring 2024, where we started to add incorporate themes. So you see like we have this banner that has a welcome um, icon on it. And then we also match the course uh, dashboard card so it matches that theme. And so students will see that, faculty will see that, um, and it makes it just, just a little touch of detail. Um, we went through and cleaned up some of the different items. We have a holder spot for a photo. We encourage faculty to show their faces so we know um, uh, we can establish a relationship with the students and uh, their instructor. We also added some new things such as a plagiarism and academic page. And then the one that really tipped this off for us, which got us the invite to present to all of you fine folks, is the communication expectations that um, personally I was heartbroken when my shell was dinged for not having this as a communication specialist, uh, that didn't sit well. So I vowed never to have that again. So we created a page where faculty can go in there and just address those components of the rubric where we failed in our first um, poker uh, review uh, shell. And so faculty sort of like, what's this? And then we didn't just drop the information into 
uh, shells and say, all right, good luck, use this stuff. We also, we, me, myself, and I created a semester start orientation view that explained how these blueprints work, how to copy content from one semester to the next semester. This was so well received. Um, we've had it for years, right? But by having content that worked, by having simple modules that faculty could bring forward and adjust, we then had specialties developed from this. So our library resources created an entire page based off of the blueprints. So we have this blueprint shell just for library resources, which allows all of our LR10 classes to have the same content uh, for the entire semester. As you can see, the little blueprint logos here, um, they own the shell. They are constantly making updates. They spend three weeks before the launch of the shell. And we, what we do is once the blueprints are all finalized, we have a set date where I will go in and, or our technologist will go in and link all the specialty blueprints first. Because if you link all courses of the blueprint, then you have a data issue with a lot of content coming and going. So what we do is we sort of go backwards. We'll do the smaller areas first. So we'll just go and type in LR10, link all the LR10 blueprints, and then that removes them from the general classes available under the blueprints. Um, this works so well. We started the library in summer last year. And then the nursing department decided to come on along online and have their own blueprints as well. Um, they All the special departments, I will say, get access to our main blueprints for the campus. And they are um, excellent users with Canvas, with Design Plus, with Course Design. And they are encouraged to take as much of our basic college blueprint items as well. But then they also have standards for nursing. So all of our nursing shells have this blueprint dropped in. And I'll, uh, the technologists will align any NURS course per the semester that we use the blueprints to the current blueprint shell. Um, this creates consistency. The nursing students who have really high stress already with their workload and their instructors now have consistency in the shells. And also there's, there's, there's formats where we know I'm gonna go to the first page, I'm gonna start here. And then from here, each instructor can go forward and change the direction of their course. So even though we have these standard templates, it's very customizable and all of our faculty, for the most part, can go in here and re remap or point where these go versus uh, to one set direction. Um, syllabus is incorporated in here. And from all of these learnings, we created some new blueprints coming forward for summer 2024. You can see our new logo. Um, we have the basics set up as far as pictures, the general policies. And then we made some adjustments for our modules where we have the overview page, we have a new page for student services and technical support, which is another rubric item that almost every one of our faculty members get dinged on because they don't have clear and easy way for students to find technical services or support services for online classes. Um, we also encourage faculty who use specialty apps like Alex or um, like McGraw Hill, where do they go for help? Because they reach out to DE, we don't have the resources or the knowledge to fix those applications. What we'll do is we'll reach out to the instructor, figure out who the source is and try and connect the student. So we wanna cut down that wait time and make sure students don't have uh, reduced access to information. So here, this is just generic stuff about um, our accessibility service center, student services. And then this next page is for technical support, which there's two ways to access from the student support. And then this has its own page, which is linked to all the basic Canvas support that students need. This page has been very well received. It includes the phone support, which we do pay for. It also includes general help, our own Canvas help desk, helping students understand the difference when to contact our IT services versus when to contact DE. Um, we tried to think about all the questions that popped up through our DE and IT help desk. We partnered with our IT folks to make sure that we're all on the same page. So this was another page that really helps us uh, meet the rubric checkoffs to go from incomplete to aligned and closer towards exemplary. And then again, you see that communication policy. And now for summer 2024, we're building an AI uh, page because this is a big uh, buzzword, as we know from uh, the CBC and OTC and other areas that AI is not going away. So we wanted to provide areas for faculty to really hash out their policies. We're working with our academic senate, we're working with our faculty group to create these policies and we don't have the right answer, but at least as we grow and information changes, our blueprints are matching what the work on campus is doing. And then for summer, you can see the uh, tech ready uh, student orientation. And then we also help faculty because one of the complaints was, I don't have time to create an anonymous survey or feedback. So we just said, okay, fine, here is your uh, feedback tool. All you have to do is go in here and customize it, drop it in and then publish it. And then you're all ready to go. 
Um, so every single semester we get feedback at our DE committee. Uh, the committee members bring the new ideas back to their divisions and then we get communication that way. We have about you know nine hours to 10 hours of flex sessions each semester that are specific to distance education. We incorporate poker policies, poker rubrics um, into these sessions, and also we tie them to the blueprints. So I hope this gives everyone just a, just a sample of one way of working with uh, our blueprints in our college. So thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Uh, any questions? I don't see any questions on the chat, which is specifically for John. Uh, but Jennifer uh, Kinzel uh, says that from San Francisco, uh, love the AI policies page and they would like to collaborate, John. <laughs> Absolutely. Feel free to reach out. I think I'm working with your another DE quarter from CCSF, so not a problem. Yeah. John, I think you might be talking about me. And first of all, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so we've been communicating and I love that you shared so much resource with us. And this course template looks really impressive. It really does. I agree. Um, any other questions? No. Well, John, I thank you so much for sharing that. I think um, that gives us all a lot of great ideas of what we can do in our college. And those of us that already have templates, you know, maybe uh, use some of the practices. I love. I like the idea of dropping in that blueprint course uh, in for faculty so that they have it there, you know, that way they don't have to go out and look for it. It's already there for them. I think that's, that's really good. Um, I do want to make sure that everybody understands that, uh, CVC does not require your college to have a template. That's not a requirement, uh, but we do encourage it just because as John mentioned, um, it covers some of the areas in the rubric that are just easy to align and that sometimes faculty miss as they're going to uh, building the course and then they get to course review. So that's just having a, uh, a template just makes it easier to make sure that those areas are aligned. So uh, we do encourage it. Um, and it's also a great resource for um, newer faculty that are just starting with their design. So ha having that, even if it's not um, something that's required, it's it's just a good resource. And I'm I'm sure that a lot of you guys that said that you have that as resources have found that to be true. Um, so we have a couple minutes left, and um, before I wrap up and you know give you uh, the final reminders and thoughts, I did see a very interesting um, something in the chat, and I now I can't remember what it is, but. Uh, let me see, let me go back. Um, I should have written it down on my little notebook next to me. No, it was an AI. It was program review. Oh no, it was the dig it was the digital learning, the digital literacy online learning basics course oh, I that Eileen brought up. So um, thank you, Eileen, for putting that question in the chat. And maybe this is something that we can talk about in a future norming session a little bit more. Um, but yeah, having some kind of readiness course for our students, for our online students, I do feel that that is um, not poker related at all, but just like, you know, for success of, of our students, sometimes having some sort of course that, um, that gets them ready for online learning. So besides like the Canvas how-tos and the Canvas basics for students, having a course that you know, gets our students um, ready, thinking about online. Um, and I do see that some people have had uh, courses, uh, some are, have continued, some, you know, um, are trying to figure out ways of making them more popular. Um, it, I, I've, I myself, again, as a distance, a distance education coordinator, I have looked into, um, creating a course like this for credit and they've said no like you can't do it it can't be for credit so um i've explored non-credit options but it is hard to get students to sign up for that course when it's not required um but anyway i just thought that was interesting in the chat all right so let me go ahead and first of all before i share my screen let me find the right slide so i'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up so I'm going to have Maria Elena, um, if you can, 
uh, link, put the link of the survey in the chat, please. So um, before you guys go, please uh, complete the survey. It's very, very short. We do appreciate your feedback. Um, so it's, I, I think it is in the chat. Yes, Marilena? It is. Yep, it's there. Thank you so much. All right. So and please, yes, I will. Sorry. And yes, I will send the attendance link also. Oh, yeah. So yeah, attendance link and survey. So take a, a few moments to um, click on those and and uh, fill those things out. Um, and then some reminders. Um, so let's talk about the poker course. Um, so the poker course offerings this spring, we still have two. One starts March 15th, another one is April 6th. So these are the poker course that gets reviewers trained to review courses. Um, so if you need the registration for those, those were that registration information was emailed to poker leads um, a little while ago. So if you have misplaced that email or you know just never received it, please send me an email and my email will pop up in a, in a slide in just a little bit, but feel free to email me and I can send you that the poker course uh, information. Um, we are planning to have some summer offerings. So be on the lookout for those. So we are going to have some poker course summer offerings. Um, the poker course addendum section D if your reviewers completed the course a while ago, they completed the four week course. Um, the course is now six weeks long because now it includes uh, section D accessibility. Uh, for those that completed the four week course, we do have an addendum section D that they can complete. They do receive a badge um, for completing the course. We are going to have that course available until June 30th. Um, on June 30th, we're planning to close out that Section D course. So if you have any reviewers that need to complete it, please let them know. Also, I also have the link. Um, so if you need it, just send me an email and I'll send you the link to register to that course. Um, so, uh, so G, Eileen asked a question about the um, schedule. She wanted to know if it was regarding poker training. Can we get it earlier? they have um, some grant needs that they need to deal with. So do you need, Eileen, do you need the dates of the summer? Oh, thank you, Brandon. Here? Um, just kind of in general, because by the time, I'm not technically the poker lead, but the poker lead didn't, said she didn't have it either. By the time we had seen the offering dates, some of them were already full. And then in order for us to request funding, like through Guided Pathways or Equity, and then send out a call to applicants. So that takes a while, right? Um, but we need that information to actually get the money. Okay. So it, it's been kind of hard to sequence uh, getting the information, getting the funding, and then putting that out to faculty to apply. So I, I just don't know kind of how the schedule happens with the CVC. Okay, Eileen and um, Brandon is asking, how early do you need uh, these dates? Like, you know, like how early do you guys have to apply for funding just to give us an idea of. Um, well, if, if the schedule is starting, like say you're offering courses in the fall, then sometime prior to the start of those fall courses, like, I don't know, a month at least so that we could see the schedule try to put in a proposal for funding. Committees usually don't meet until September, right? The first committee meeting that would approve it. So, um, you know, trying to get into that cycle of proposing, getting the funding applicants out and then putting them into the, you know, getting things, getting um, applicants chosen and then into courses. So I can speak to that a little bit more directly. A month before is easily doable. If for some reason you're not seeing it a month before, you can either reach out to me or Sochi directly in terms of how the schedule is being done. As you know, the last year was a bit of a transition for us, but we're currently trying to do some work on the next on the schedule for the next annual year. So I'm hoping sometime by April we should at least have the summer offerings posted, if not the fall. No promises, but man, working diligently on that. Thanks, Brandon. But but Eileen, if you have 
But Eileen, if you have a specific schedule, if you have a specific question, because we said a month before too, sometimes I'm also wondering if an email get missed. And of course, there's, you know, there are challenges on the website. If you ever have any questions, message Sochi or message me directly. We can usually get you that answer pretty quickly. Okay, thanks. And then also, is it possible to um, post, you know, in our, in that poker second site where the it's a poker resource center um the meetings for these statewide um norming we have people who are poker trained who would you know still like to attend even though they're not funded technically anymore and then for the new people just so that um poker leads change a lot mm. and so <laughs> rather than having to deal with email too much um, if they could just be posted in general then we could all just go there and then you wouldn't have to send out all those emails we could just it'd be our responsibility whoever the poker lead is to go look check it regularly and then disseminate that information i think Jeanette also put that in the chat as a request yeah thank you so so the poker norming sessions i can definitely do that i can add the schedule for the for poker norming sessions in on our poker site um however i do want to clarify the poker course so the registration information for those courses go out to the leads and i don't like to make those public because i like the leads to have to decide who gets that link, um, if that makes sense. So I don't know what your process is to um, get reviewers to register to that course. So I don't want to like overstep your process. Sometimes I will get emails from faculty members um, or, or just people from, the, from colleges asking me for the poker course registration link. I give them the lead information. So I said, you have a poker lead. This is who it is. Please contact them and they have the registration information. If they don't have them contact me, just because I want to make sure that whatever your process is for getting reviewers, um, you're the one giving them those uh, registration links. Hopefully that makes sense. But the norming sessions, definitely, that's a great idea. I will uh, post those on our site. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, so equity in online courses, if you have any practices at your college for um, reviewing equity when you're doing your regular, um, you know, course review with uh, the CBC rubric, please uh, let me know if you're able to or willing to present. Uh, that's one of the questions in our um, survey. So I'm, I'm looking for people that would like to uh, present how they um how they review equity in our online courses. Um, all right, and then thanks for attending everyone. Um, our next norming session is Wednesday, May the 29th. Uh, going back to emails and things like that, I wanna also clarify that the email for the norming session, the registration goes out about a month, a month before this day of May 29th it does go directly to the poker leads. So I have an email list of all the poker leads. It goes out to them. That email does tell the leads to forward the registration link to anyone else that they feel should attend the session. These sessions are not closed. These are open to all reviewers um, across the state. So, um, you know, please um, make sure that you reach out to your poker lead, but I will add some information on our site, like I, like we met, like I mentioned, um, but I just want to make that really clear. Um, there are times where those emails do go to either the junk or the clutter email. That happens often. I don't know the reason, but um, if you do, if you're a lead and you don't get that email about a, a month before this date, please send me an email. And my email is right there on that slide. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you so very much for attending. I appreciate um, your participation. I hope that you found this session helpful. And if you have any poker questions, please reach out to me, send me an email, and I'll be happy to connect with you. 
and um, answer your question as best as I can. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, a wonderful weekend, and we will see you May 20th or maybe sooner. Bye, everyone.